Today we're going to talk about electron drift. And electron drift is responsible for producing currents in wires. So let's suppose we've got a conducting piece of wire. It could be a copper wire. Then inside that wire we would have what's called a lattice of positive ions. So these positive ions are vibrating about points. This word lattice, it's just kind of a three-dimensional ladder. Here's a drawing of a ladder. A lattice would simply the, be the points at all the vertexes here in the ladder. And then if we make this three-dimensional, we can put some points in behind there, and then it'd be more like a scaffolding. This network of points is called a lattice. And so all of these positive ions are vibrating about a point in the lattice. Now why are all these ions positively charged? Well, it's because the atoms have lost electrons. So there's still lots of electrons in that ion, but there's some electrons that aren't attached to any particular atom. And we call those electrons, we either call them free electrons, or we call them conduction electrons. And they're subject to all kinds of forces. Naturally, the electron here would be attracted to these positive charges. But when the electron gets very close to the ion, then there's going to be outer shell electrons, which are going to repel those electrons. And then, of course, the ions themselves are vibrating. So it's a fairly complicated situation for those electrons. And their motion would just kind of be random. They just kind of bounce around inside this network of positive ions. When they get too close to one of the ions, the electrons within the ion repel it away. So let's suppose that we have an electric field in the wire. And we'd obtain that by having, say, a high voltage on one side of the wire and a lower voltage on the other side of the wire. And that would create an electric field from high voltage to low voltage. So the electrons would feel an added force now in the opposite direction of the electric field because they're negatively charged. So there'd be an overall force on the electrons to the right. So what's now going to happen with the motion of the electrons is it's still going to have this kind of ra random pattern. But because of that general force to the right, it will slowly migrate across the wire. And typically, its migration will only be at, say, a millimeter per second. So there's this slow migration. And we call that the electron drift. This little diagram from Paul Hewitt provides a nice explanation as to why we get this drift velocity. So if we turn on our electric field when the electron is right here, the green, the solid green line, is the path it would have taken if there were no E field. And the dotted line is the path it would be taken with the E field, with it turned on. So after a given amount of time, the electron ends up being to the right of where it would be if there were no electric field, all due to that force to the right by the electric field. So if we were to take that distance, and divided by the amount of time since the field was turned on, we would get the drift velocity. It would be equal to that distance over the time since the electric field was turned on. And it turns out those drift velocities are of the order of millimeters per second. So it's a very, very slow. And it's a very different speed than how fast, say, the electron is moving along its path. So if we looked at its speed along this path here, we would find that this electron speed would be typically of the order, say, 10 to the fifth meters per second. So the electron's really moving fast. It's just drifting slowly. And that's quite different from the signal speed. Signal speed is actually the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And that's really important. Because when I flick a switch on, I don't want to wait for a couple hours 
for the electrons to drift to the appliance. Uh, when I throw the switch, I want things to occur immediately, simultaneously. They don't actually occur simultaneously, they occur at the speed of light. But for practical purposes, we can think of it as being simultaneous. And it's kind of like if you've got a water pipe. And your water pipe is full of water, in the same way that our conducting wire is full of these free electrons. Now, if I push a little more water in this side of the pipe, simultaneously, water is going to flow out the other side of the pipe. Now, there is a very, very small time lag because those forces have to transmit from one to another between the water molecules. And in the same way, those forces have to transmit from one to another between the electrons. But the overall effect is that as soon as I throw on the switch, turn on the electric field, the electrons throughout the wire all start flowing simultaneously. Let's see if you are listening. Quick IB question. Read it over, try it out, come back for the answer. Drift velocity of the order of a few millimeters per second. Correct answer is D. Your IB data booklet gives you this equation here, and it relates the current to the drift velocity. So let's go through one by one the symbols in that equation. Of course, I is the current. But keep in mind, current is really the amount of charge passing a point each second. Secondly, we've got this N, or it might be a Greek letter eta, I'm not sure, but it's the charge carrier density, or charge carrier concentration. Now for us, we're always going to be talking about current flow through a conducting wire. And in that case, of course, the charge carriers are the conduction electrons, or the free electrons. So for our examples, this is going to be the number of conduction electrons, free electrons, per unit volume. So typically, the units there would be per meter cubed, or meters to the minus three. Now, how do we get these charge carrier densities? We typically just look them up in a table. So this free electron concentration, that's the conduction electron concentration. And for, say, copper, its value is 8.5 times 10 to the 28th. So there's 8.5 times 10 to the 28th free electrons in one cubic meter of copper. Next on our list is A, which is the cross-sectional area of the wire. So in this diagram, A would be that cross-sectional area if we made a perpendicular cut through our wire. Of course, if you're putting your charge carrier densities in meters to the minus three, you need to put your areas in meters squared, so you're consistent with your units. Typically, to get that cross-sectional area, you would use the manufacturer's gauge number for the wire to figure out the cross-sectional area. So, for instance, if the gauge number were six, and here AWG stands for the American Wire Gauge Number. So if that number is six, then the cross-sectional area in millimeters squared would be 13.3. So we can look up all these cross-sectional areas if we know the gauge number. Next is, of course, the drift speed or the drift velocity. I like to put a D in there to remind myself that that is drift velocity or drift speed. And then finally, we've got Q, which is going to be the charge per charge carrier. And being as we're going to be exclusively working with conducting wires, we know that our charge carriers are electrons. So Q will equal the charge of an electron. And the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So in pretty much all the questions that we do, Q is going to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now, I don't think you're responsible for deriving the drift velocity equation, but the derivation involves a lot of ideas that come up in IB exams. So I'm going to go over the derivation of this equation. So it's an equation for the current, and by definition, current is equal to the amount of charge that passes a point per second. So it's delta Q over delta T. 
And what we're going to do is imagine a cylinder inside of our conducting wire. And of course, that cylinder would be filled with lots of these free electrons. So let's suppose our cylinder is moving at exactly the same speed as the drift velocity of the electrons. So as the cylinder moves forward, all the free electrons are going to move forward with it. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our delta t equal to exactly one second. So we're going to let our cylinder move forward for one second. And then, of course, if it's moving at the drift speed, and it does so for one second, this distance here, which is really the height of the cylinder, is just going to be equal, be equal to the drift velocity times one, or it's going to be equal in value to the drift velocity. So now let's see what happens to our current here. Since delta t is equal to one, the current is just going to equal delta q inside the cylinder. And of course, the amount of charge enclosed in that cylinder is going to depend on the number of charge carriers, the number of free electrons per unit volume. That's what we've been calling n or eta. So it's the number of charge carriers per meter cubed. Now, if we multiply that by the volume, of course, the meter cubes are going to ca cancel out, and we'll just get the number of charge carriers. And then, of course, if we multiply that by the charge per charge carrier, that's what we call Q, then we're going to get the total charge inside the, the cylinder. So our expression right now is N times V times Q. But let's re-express our volume of the cylinder. That's just going to eat the, equal the height of the cylinder times this cross-sectional area here. But the height is equal to the drift velocity, so we can express our volume as equal to the drift velocity times A. And then we've got our expression for the current inside the wire. It's just N times A drift velocity times charge. So there's the derivation of the drift velocity equation. Okay, a practice question for you. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So we're looking for the time to flow down the wire. and That's going to equal the length of the wire divided by the drift velocity. So we've got to figure out that drift velocity. So we can start with the drift velocity equation and rearrange that for the drift velocity. Don't forget you're going to have to convert this cross-sectional area in millimeters squared into meters squared. So let's do that. 3.3 millimeters squared. And we want to get rid of those millimeters squared. Put it into meters. Of course, there's a thousand millimeters in one meter and then we're going to have to square that so our millimeters can cancel out and we'll get meters squared. Of course the answer is going to be 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. So let's substitute all our values in. Current was 3.0 amperes. Looking up on the table we found the carrier density to be 8.5 times 10 to the 28th cross-sectional area 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 6 and of course the charge per charge carrier or the charge of an electron 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Work that out you should get 6.7 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second so our drift velocity 6.7 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second so let's see how much time it's going to take. Our distance was 2 meters. Divide that by 6.7 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. You're going to get a time there of, of about 29,900 seconds. Divide that by 3,600 because there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. And you'll get a time there of about 8.3 hours. So it's a very good thing that we don't have to wait for drift currents in order for electrical devices to start up. Let's summarize the big ideas from the video. The first was that these conduction, also called the free electrons, 
they execute a complex motion, a seemingly random motion, that shows an overall migration opposite to the direction of the electric field. So if our electric field is in this direction, the electron would kind of bounce in around, but show an overall drift opposite to that electric field. And that all gets summarized by this equation for electric current. It's equal to this n, which is the number of charge carriers per unit volume times A, A is the cross-sectional area of the wire, times the all-important drift velocity, or drift speed, times Q, and Q is the charge per charge carrier, and because our charge carriers are electrons, our Q is generally going to be equal to the charge of an electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And so in the end, this drift velocity, it's of the order just millimeters per second. And that's a very different from the signal velocity, which is at the speed of light, simultaneous for our purposes. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.